Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Daryl Stickle about building trust in hostile environments. Daryl Stickle, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you today. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. Where are you joining us from today? I'm in Victoria, British Columbia. Oh, I love Victoria. So beautiful. Uh, We were just there. My family was there uh, this summer on the tail end of an Alaskan cruise trip, and uh, we had a day in Victoria. It was just gorgeous. Uh, Anyways, I'm a little bit jealous. A beautiful (laughs) time of year as well. Um, pleasure to be with you, and I'm excited to be talking about building trust in hostile environments. Uh, I think that'll make more sense here in a little bit um, when I re- share your bio, uh, but a uh, super interesting topic, and I'm excited to explore that with you. As we get started, I'll share Daryl's bio with everybody. Daryl Stickle has devoted his career to understanding trust, what it is, how it functions, and how to increase it. He holds a PhD in business from Duke University and wrote his doctoral thesis on building trust in hostile environments. After leaving McKinsey and Company in 2001, he founded Trust Unlimited. His clients have included financial services, telecoms, tech families and Canadian military in Afghanistan. He is also a professor at the Luxembourg School of Business, teaching in the MBA program and in their executive education program. His book, Building Trust, Exceptional Leadership in an Uncertain World, is out, and I'm excited to talk a little bit about that today as well. Daryl is legally blind, lives in Victoria, Canada with his two sons and his trusty sidekick, his seeing eye dog, Drake. A wonderful again to have you, Daryl. Anything else you would like to share with me or my audience by way of your background or personal context before we dive on in? No, you pretty much nailed it, John. Okay, great. Well, why don't you start by just telling us a little bit uh, about why trust? Why is trust such a driving force in your academic work, your teaching, your research, as well as in your consulting and, and professional work? Yeah, so I, I was born and raised in a small town in northern Canada, and it was a fairly isolated community. And it was a place where people helped each other if they could. And the sort of mindset was the strong should protect the weak. And so I grew up feeling like if I could be helpful, I should. I had a series, of, you know, I had a difficult time growing up, a uh, number of concussions, some uh, family challenges, and sometimes a hard road's a good teacher. And so I would find myself, you know, when I, when I moved to Victoria to go to school, I would find myself sitting on the bus and people would sit down next to me and just say, I'm really having a hard time. And so there was something about me that caused people to be comfortable and to open up. And so I started down the path towards becoming a clinical psychologist. And I was working with nonprofits, working with uh, families in crisis, troubled teens, uh, working on crisis lines, all these things to sort of hone my skills. And I came to realize that a lot of the people I was working with were really just doing the best they could. And you could see a path forward for them, but they they just couldn't get there. And I thought this will drive me insane. Um, So I shifted and went into public administration I was working in native land claims and they would ask me these sort of deep philosophical questions like what is self-government or what will the province look like 50 years after claims are settled? And the last question they asked me was how do we convince a group of people we've shafted for over a hundred years, they should trust us. 
And I thought, wow, that's a good question. And so I went to Duke and wrote my doctoral thesis on building trust in hostile environments. And, and the rest sort of played out from there. Yeah. Thank you for that background. And that leads into, of course, your ongoing work uh, in building yeah. trust and, and helping others to better understand it and to better develop it. And so certainly this has implications and applications to all aspects of life. You know, trust in any relationship is key and foundational. Um, in the workplace, of course, it's it's super important. And a successful leader has to be able to um, have a foundation of, of trust with the people that they're leading. Uh, let's take, if you wouldn't mind just taking us uh, through a little bit of the development of, of your book, Building Trust, sure. Exceptional Leadership in an Uncertain World. Um, why this book? Why now? And, right. uh, and and then we can start to get into it a little bit. Yeah, so um, I've spent the last 20 years helping people better understand trust problems and to build skills, to increase their skills at building trust. And I agree with everything you said. Trust trust acts as a social lubricant. It's the For me, it's the differentiator between a leader who's merely okay and one who's exceptional. Because the more senior we become, the less direct control we have over outcomes. And the more important our ability, you know, all of our success and, and aspirations come through the actions of others. And so our ability to build trust is one of the things that differentiates us. And we're seeing more of this as, as we're seeing more turbulent times. We're observing a bunch of wicked problems, things like climate change, things like race relations, things like uh, political divides, all of which require some level of collective collaborative action. But trust is at the lowest levels we've ever seen. And for me, I've had these incredible results over the last 20 years helping people. You know, I've helped financial services firms make huge amounts of money, but I've also helped parents reconnect with their kids. Uh, leaders have dramatic impact. And I felt like I was dropping small grains of sand in the ocean. And I wanted to pick up a great big rock and make bigger waves particularly with what we're seeing right now with these with these challenges that the world is facing, and it's not getting better. Um, I wanted people to have a clearer sense because we can be intentional about building trust. We can make the world a better place. I've seen it happen too often. And I wrote the book so that my voice could be heard at, at a larger scale. You know, because a lot of people are talking about trust and how much it matters. Yeah. There's not a lot of people talking about what to actually do about it. Yeah, I think most people recognize it's important, but then whether it's intentional or not, people do all sorts of things just in their daily actions and how they interact with people and what they say and do that undermine the very foundation of the trust that they say is important, right? And right. so, uh, you know, it, it really has to be something not that we not only understand conceptually why it's important, but it has to be something that we start to develop the skills associated with it and to build the muscles around uh, developing trust. And, and you aptly pointed out, I mean, we live in turbulent times. Uh, trust in institutions is, I don't know, I, I don't know the data to be able to say whether or not it's at an all-time low, but it sure feels like it's at an all-time low. Yeah. Um, you know, people yeah. don't trust institutions, uh, especially younger generations. Uh, and and there's just so many challenges from, you know, economic, social, political upheaval, uh, of course, the pandemic and all that that brought with it, uh, right. the, the the disruption in the workplace uh, and, and all of that, everything together just makes for this really challenging time. And leaders, especially as we focus in on leaders within organizations for this conversation, you know, leaders have to do more than maybe they've ever had to do in the past to try to develop and maintain the trust. I mean, it used to be, you just kind of, you had this like psychological contract employer with employees show up, yep. do the work, do a decent job. You get paid, you have some reasonable job security, et cetera. And that's not what leaders do anymore. They're, they're not just like managing and making sure people show up and do their work. It's like, you have to almost be a social worker and you have to, you know, be able to, you know, really help support people in a whole wide variety of ways uh, so the challenges for leaders are higher than I think they may have ever been. And I agree. as everyone else is facing all these other things. And, and let's also not forget that leaders are facing the same stuff that their people are, right?
Yeah. And, and so for me, there's a, you know, people will ask me why is trust in decline? And, and you're right. According to the uh, surveys and uh, a lot of the metrics we see, trust is at the lowest levels we've ever seen. And some, some people have, have questioned the success or continued to survival of democracy, given the low trust levels in government uh, and the election process and those kinds of things. Um, for me, trust is a combination of uncertainty and vulnerability. You know, when, when people are deciding whether to trust someone, they ask themselves two fundamental questions. The first is how likely am I to be harmed, which is perceived uncertainty. And the second is if I'm harmed, how bad is it going to hurt, which is perceived vulnerability. And so it's uncertainty times vulnerability gives us a level of perceived risk. And we each have a threshold of risk that we're comfortable with. And if our perception of that risk goes beyond that threshold, we don't trust. And if it's beneath it, then we do. And so Building trust actually becomes relatively simple if we frame it this way. It's where does uncertainty come from and how do we take steps to reduce it? And where does vulnerability come from and how do we take steps to manage that? And the unfortunate thing for leaders right now is that things that historically worked don't anymore because uncertainty in the environment is increasing at such a rapid pace. And so if I do exactly what I used to do or exactly what my forebears did, then Trust is going to be in decline because of the levels of uncertainty from other situations or other places. So how do we start that process of, of better understanding how to address the uncertainty issues uh, to feed, you know, so we can have people who are willing to be a little bit more vulnerable? Uh, and, you know, th those issues that you just raised, I think, are, are really important. So how do we start this? If, if we're sitting here listening to this, thinking about it, things right. that we can start to do right here, right now, today, this week. Yeah. So for me, there's 10 levers that we can pull. Four of them incur, occur in the uncertainty box. Uh, so there's uncertainty that comes from us as individuals and uncertainty that comes from the context that we're embedded in. If we start, you know, Roger Mayer and his colleagues wrote a seminal piece in 1995 about trustworthiness. And they proposed three different elements that led to perceptions of trustworthiness. And those were benevolence, integrity, and ability. That's where most of the research sits. Um, and so benevolence is the belief you've got my best interest at heart, that you'll act in my best interest. Integrity is, do I follow through on my promises? And do my actions align with the values I express? And abilities, do I have the competence to do what I say I'm going to do? And so, you know, I worked with a leader who uh, worked for an organization that, that actually measured trust levels. Now, the, their trust measure wasn't great, um, but they had a ranking from minus 100 to 100. And... And their score was 13. And we actually just sat down. Uh, I spent a couple of months working with them. And then we sat down with their team and said, here's what benevolence is. And it's, you know, this belief that you've got my best interest at heart. What could your leader do to show benevolence to you? And so now we're giving them the same framework, the same talking points. And we've reduced a bunch of the potential misconceptions because we've, we've defined trust. Trust is the willingness to make yourself vulnerable when you could choose to do otherwise and when you can't completely predict how someone else is going to behave. So there's elements of vulnerability and uncertainty there. And so we, we've got them all on the same page about what trust is. And then we start talking about the different levers. And we say, what here's what integrity is. Are there places where the organization's falling down or where your leader's falling down? What are the commitments that you're hearing? And how could they pull that lever? And what does good look like from a leader? You know, ability tends to be our favorite lever to pull, but we often massively misdefine what excellence is. And so, you know, if I'm standing in front of a group of leaders, I'll say, who here is an excellent leader? And all the hands go up and I'll say, well, this is, you know, fantastic. What does that mean? And they'll just stare at me. You know, it just seems like something I should think I'm good at. And so if we don't start including the other stakeholders in that conversation about what excellence looks like, then we're going to miss. And so after three months, this leader that I was coaching and, and advising got reevaluated and their score went from 13 to 80. And now they're at 100 and have stayed there for the last two years. And so partly it's about how do we have conversations now, I've told you that trust is a combination of uncertainty and vulnerability. You could go out after this episode and say to someone, you know, I was talking to this guy and he said, trust is a combination of uncertainty and vulnerability. 
And I think about how are we vulnerable to each other? You know, what are the information? What's the information we share? How do my successes depend on you? How am I vulnerable to you? How are you vulnerable to me? And what are the uncertainties we have about each other? How well do we know each other? Do you understand my context and the things that, that drive my behavior? What if I clarified that for you? Now we're having a conversation about trust that's not quite as fuzzy as it might have been. And then let's say the next conversation is around benevolence. We want to pull that lever. Um, so you say, you know, I heard this guy, Daryl, he was talking about benevolence, said it's, you know, the belief you've got my best interest at heart. And I think I do that, but it doesn't always seem to land that way. Have you ever experienced that? The other person goes, oh, of course I have. Yeah, this situation, that situation. And then you start to narrow the funnel. And you say, when's the time that someone really seemed to have your back? They really seem to be on your side. And what did they do? And so now we've got them thinking about situations that they had, and they're giving us hints about how to be benevolent towards them. Now we narrow the funnel even more. We say, what would it look like if I had your best interest at heart? What does success look like for you? How do I help you get there? Now we've got the opportunity to be transparent, right? Because we can refer back to that. So my oldest son wanted to get a baseball scholarship. Now all of a sudden, I'm able to frame all of our conversations around that goal. And I'm able to talk to him about his homework because he's got to do well in school to get a scholarship. I'm able to talk to him about his work ethic, his diet, exercise, how he connects with his team and his coaches, all these things that sound like nagging are now all of a sudden benevolence because we interpret the world through stories and we need to be actually talking to each other about what our stories are and how we connect them to the actions that we take. And so those are ways we can pull a couple of the levers. And, and what I did in the book was, was try to systematically go through the entire model, all 10 levers, and then talk about how to pull them. And when I work with clients, I get them to, you know, so much of our training and learning feels like fire and forget. I actually get them to systematically go through and I show them a little bit of stuff. And then they, they go out and they have a trust buddy. They practice with someone. And, you know, you, you gave a great analogy of exercising those trust muscles. Well, they routinely come back saying, okay, so it felt awkward and it was unusual for me, but the response was so positive. I'm going to try that again. And so we start to see behavior change because they're, they're trying new skills, being successful, getting positive reinforcement for it. Now it becomes part of their toolkit. And so we teach people, you know, we all have the ability to build trust. Some are just better than others. And so those who aren't very good have a lever that they pull. Usually it's the ability lever. I have these kinds of credentials, this background, this much experience. Those who are better have multiple levers. Those who are really good have multiple levers and know when to pull which one. Because if, if there's a gap between you and I and it's on benevolence and I'm pulling the ability lever, I miss. And so I try to help people expand the number of levers that they understand and are able to pull. And then also try to help guide them in terms of when to pull which one so they understand and are able to diagnose a little better. Yeah, that's excellent. And I love uh, how you how you lay all that out um, systematically. And this whole idea that this is something we can develop. So, you know, there yeah. are people that kind of just naturally have that interpersonal, you know, th that emotional intelligence and that that EQ, the ability to to establish and maintain trust. And it almost seems it, like it just comes naturally, completely right. easy to them. My, my suspicion is they still work at it too. But I, the point here is that I think everyone, whether you feel like it comes naturally to you or not, everyone can work at this. They can learn tools that they can develop, skills that they can develop and practice over time. Uh, and then I think one of the things you mentioned just a minute ago that I just want to double click on for a moment is just, are you willing to go to bat for your people? Are you willing right. to be an advocate for your people? Um there's a lot of things you can do to try to develop trust and, and you should do them. Um, but oftentimes it comes down to very simply people know uh, over time they, they interact with you and they know whether or not you are a person of integrity 
who they can rely on and who will, yeah. you're someone who will go for, go to bat for them and will advocate for them. And yeah. that is so rare for people to have that, uh, that you want to d- establish and maintain good trust with your people. Uh, just be willing to go to bat for them. I, in my mind, that's what a good leader needs to do. Uh, and it, there's always this tension, right? So if I'm in middle management, there's always this tension of, am I there to support up the line or am I there to support down the line? And the truth is both, right? right? And you have to yeah. navigate that tension. Um, but if I'm going, you know, I, I'm always of the mindset in leadership roles that if I'm going to err on the side of leaning too far one way or the other, I want to lean t- downwards because yeah. those are the people who have less voice, less power. Um, and they're the ones that often will, will get, you know, taken advantage of or exploited in some way, even if it's inadvertent. And so, you know, just focusing in on, uh, how you can advocate for your people successfully, I think will go a really, really long way. Yeah. You're bang on John. And, and let's think about, you know, like I said, there's 10 levers. Let's think about the three that people are most familiar with benevolence, integrity, and ability. As time has changed, as the role of the leader has changed, it's become more and more difficult to predict what excellence is or is going to be. We've struggled to define it. As things move more quickly, integrity gets harder because it's harder to follow through on promises. It's harder to make promises that have any staying power at all. But benevolence, that belief that we've got someone's best interest at heart, that they're feeling like we're looking out for them, that stands the test of any situation. And it's one of the places where we've fallen down the most lately. If we think about virtual meetings and we think about Zoom conversations, we get so conf- so focused, so concerned with production and getting things done because we've got so many meetings and we're lined up and let's get the tasks finished. We've had less and less time to think about the best interest of those we're working with. And, you know, one of the things that historically has driven performance for organizations is something called organizational citizenship behaviors, people's willingness to go above and beyond for an organization. And that's in decline. We, we hear conversations about quiet quitting, people working to rule, people, you know, being disengaged. Higher trust levels give us a higher level of engagement. If you look out for your people, they'll go through a wall for you. And they will drive success for you in a way that you can't even imagine. And so it's such a profound differentiator, you know, and and some of the most powerful moments I've seen are in conversations between leaders and the people they lead, where they're able to actually start to hone in and include them in the conversation about what matters to them. What does benevolence look like to you? How do I help you be successful? What does success look like? And it doesn't mean being nice all the time, right? It, It can mean you know, like with my son, I want to get a baseball scholarship. Okay, I need to be a little tougher on you around some of these issues. And you know what? He got his baseball scholarship and he's been thriving. It's been incredibly successful. And the whole way, he's felt like I had his best interest at heart. And that's the story he has of me. So he gives me the benefit of the doubt. If things go wrong, he asks questions rather than making assumptions. You know, if there's a disagreement, He's curious rather than angry. And we can have that same experience with the people we lead or with our families. Yeah, absolutely. Daryl, this has just been such a great conversation. I know we've only scratched the surface. We could go on talking about trust all day long. Um, there's so much there, but I also think, you know, on the one hand, it's complicated. It's, it's nuanced. There's so many different pieces to pull apart uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, it also isn't rocket science. And it's something we can all start doing right away. I really appreciate you sharing your time, your insights with me and my audience. Before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, uh, your book, where they can find it, and then give us the final word on the topic for today. Sure. Uh, So you can find me at uh, trustunlimited.com. That's the website of the organization. And in the blog section, there's all kinds of articles and podcasts. Most of them won't be as good as this one, but you can reach me at daryl at trustunlimited.com. That's my email address. Or you can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Daryl Stickle. Uh, the book is available anywhere you buy books online. It's available as an ebook and as an audio book. I think that 
we can make the world a better place. And we just need to be a little more intentional about it. And when people see the model that I've developed, overwhelmingly, they say, wow, this is obvious. You know, it feels like common sense. Uh, so I encourage people to get the book and, and read it and start applying it. Uh, let's work together to make the world a better place. Wonderful. Thank you, Daryl. It's just been a pleasure. Again, I encourage my audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Daryl can do for you. Check out the book. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.